God. Amen. We're so grateful to have you here, sir. And let me just say, welcome home. He's got the G1 on. I love you, sir. Take your yes, sir. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Already a presence that is powerful in this house. But I just feel I got to let somebody know right now that God is never late. I don't think you understand the weight of what I just said. God is never late. He is always on time. How many are ready to see what that God that is always on time and never late is going to do in this house? Amen. Father, we love you. We worship you, Jesus. I'm telling you, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that two people were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost today. Two people washed, blood-bought in baptism. You know why I'm, I'm acknowledging God for what He did today, filling two people with the Holy Ghost, that precious gift? is because that is the single greatest miracle that one could ever experience. A God that feels all time and space and stretches himself from everlasting to everlasting comes and dwells in a body of flesh. That's the single greatest miracle. And we're saying, where are the blinded eyes being opened? Where are the deaf ears hearing? Where are the dead being raised back to life? Folks, when you receive the Holy Ghost, that is the blind receiving their sight, that is the deaf receiving their hearing, and that is the dead coming back to life. So I'm thankful that he did that for, for our friends today. Amen. But it's so good to be back with all of you, our guests that are here, the church, Laranja, that has been so faithful. I honor you for your walk with God, your week of consecration. And I believe that this will be a year unlike any other year. This is not just a new year. This is, this is a new decade. That's why there's, there's just so much going on in the spirit right now that we're like kind of reeling and rocking what's going on we're getting all kinds of reports it's like it's the best of times but it's the worst of times but uh, I just I, I want to know where I am in the midst of all of it amen so with the word tonight I believe it's a it's going to help us to see like pastor had said so if you have your bibles Luke chapter 15 give honor to pastor his wife and and uh, all the church staff that is here in Laranja, some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, just kindest, gentlest people that you'll ever meet in your lives. Amen. Luke chapter 15. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Let me just stop because this kind of stuck out. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine, where? Sometimes he'll leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness because he's waiting on that one. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety-nine and just persons which need no repentance. Verse 8, Either. 
What woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And he said, and a certain man had two sons. I want you to pray with me tonight. I want you to pray with me that the lost would become found. That our eyes would be open. And that we could find our way. Would you pray that right now? Would you, if you got family here, or if you got a wife by your side, I want you to take her hand. And I want you to take your family. And I want you to lift their hand towards heaven. And I want you to begin to pray for them like you want them to pray for you. Would you do that right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We come together right now believing you that you can do anything, that you can do all things. But first, oh God, I pray that you would allow the living word to preach the written word. And I pray with clarity that you would come into this house leading us, directing us. I pray that you would illuminate our eyes to see what we have not yet seen. And that you would do in us what you've desired and designed for this night, oh God. We receive that grace to do a work, oh God, through your power. And we pray it all according to your perfect will and everybody said in Jesus name amen and before you're seated I want you to look at your neighbor and give him a real mean look and I want you to tell him get lost look at your other neighbor tell him get lost and you may be seated Hallelujah. Get lost. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the varying differences of being lost. In other words, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about the le- levels, if you will, of lostness. Because there are varying differences of being lost. Not in the sense that one person can be more lost than another. Because James 2 and 10, we know it says that if you're guilty of one point of the law, you're guilty of all of it. So that eradicates the thought process that one person can be more lost than the other. So we cannot ever become self-righteous and think we're better off than somebody else. So that's not what I'm talking about. Like one person is farther away from God than another. That is not the case because if you are guilty of one point of the law, you are guilty of all of it. So don't judge somebody just because they sin differently than you. But when I'm talking about the varying differences of being lost, I'm talking about our consciousness and our awareness of where we are in relationship to God. It's about a consciousness. It's not about distance. It's about where awareness. Because there can be somebody that is completely far away from God, but they are well aware of it. And somebody... Just be a way, a little ways away from God and not even realize it. Because when I was reading this parable to you in Luke chapter 15, Jesus himself, he is talking to two groups of people. He is talking to the publicans and the sinners. But then the Pharisees and the scribes come. And Jesus begins to tell three seemingly different similar stories he talks about a lost sheep that that wanders away from the 99 he talks about a lost coin that is lost uh, from, from a lady that loses this coin but then he goes and says and a certain man had two sons see Jesus was telling a parable 
parable is a, a, a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And he says a certain man, obviously a father, has two sons. And the younger of the son, he comes to the father and says, Give me the portion of goods that follow to me. Give me my inheritance, which is to say, You're dead to me, father. And he took his inheritance, and the Bible said that he went to a far land. He had wandered away from the father. He left the farm, and he wasted everything with riotous living. But all of a sudden, in, in verse 17 of chapter 15, the Bible says, Why, he's a great way off. He's wasted everything the Bible said and when he came to himself all of a sudden while he's in that pig pen he gains an awareness of where he is he comes to himself he is completely conscious of where he now is and how far he has strayed from the father but at the other on the other side there is that elder brother that he has never left the farm but has distanced himself from his daddy See, these are the varying differences of being lost. There is one that is in a far country and has wandered away, but he is very much aware of where he actually is in relationship to his father. But on the other hand, that elder son, he has never left the farm, but he is nowhere near his daddy. He is just as lost as that younger son that had wandered away, but this elder brother had never left the farm, but just because he been faithful doesn't mean that he is found see Jesus is talking to the two groups of people and says there's two sons obviously but I want you to catch this man I'm, I'm mad pastor just left because this was about where it gets good well, well then we'll just wait no I'm just but you have to understand, this elder brother, he had been faithfully serving, and he had never left the farm. He said, I haven't broke your commandments. I haven't transgressed your law. I've served you all these years. But he did not realize the distance that he had allowed to get in between him and his daddy. Even though you are faithful, there can be things that distance you from your father, and you not even know it. And you can look, why? because you have that younger son he's out and the Bible said that he is wasting his inheritance with riotous living but gives no details to what he was doing but then when it comes to the elder brother and he is mad because that, that younger son came home and he's mad about the relationship of the father and his brother see uh, because he said I've served you all these years See, when you make the father like an employer, that in turn makes your brother your competition. See, he said, I served you all these years. You didn't give me what you just gave him. Right? So he, he's saying, and he's allowing his service to get in between him and his father, his faithfulness. But he doesn't even realize how far he has wandered. But watch what he said. He said, I've been with you this whole time, and you never gave to me what you gave to him. And now that this son of yours, that he's come home, that wasted all of his living on harlots? Wait a minute. How's the elder brother know what the Bible didn't tell us? Because you got the younger son. He's out there. He's far away. He ends up in a pig pen. And he knows that he's lost. But the elder brother, he has no clue. Because he's never left the farm. But doesn't realize he's just as lost. Because watch now. How did he know the details of what his brother was doing? Because you had one that was in a pig pen looking home. But then you have one that's still on the farm looking at a pig pen. 
See, you can be in the Father's house and never have left the farm, but your focus can be off. And you can be looking out at a pig pen longing for what's out there while they're out there longing for what's in here. So I'm telling you, these are different variations of being lost. See, you can be here and you can be faithful and you can come here every Sunday. You can wear the uniform and pay your tithes, but still be just as lost as somebody out in a pig pen. So it's not about distance. It's about awareness of where you are in relationship to the Father. Because if you read, these are three seemingly different stories. But if you read, Pastor, this is what I wanted to share, that all the other stuff was just waiting for Pastor to get back. But Luke chapter 15 these three different stories are linked because uh, verse 3 says about Jesus talking to these two groups of people. It says, and he spake this parable unto them. He called all three of the stories one parable. They're all linked because it's a sheep a lost coin, and two lost boys. Because the first two, or the third, is a hybrid of the first two stories. The first story is that lost sheep that wanders from the fold, out in the field, away from the shepherd. And that sheep, the sheep, is, is it has a consciousness, it has a certain degree of awareness that when it's out there all by itself, away from the shepherd, exposed to the elements, it is fully aware that it is in danger. It is fully fully aware that it is being exposed and it's vulnerable to the elements of this life. So the sheep knows that it's lost. It has a certain degree of awareness. But the Bible said that there comes either a woman. This wasn't just any woman. She loses one coin of ten pieces. Now this wasn't just any coin. But the thing about a coin is, a coin's inanimate. It doesn't have a consciousness. It doesn't have an awareness. So when she loses it, it doesn't know that it's lost. So you can be lost like that coin in the house and not know it. Because here's the thing. Let me break this down just a little bit further. Because this coin is not just any coin. This coin belonged to what they called in those days a dowry. A dowry was a, a set of ten coins that were stringed together and a groom would give them to his bride. So this wasn't just any woman. This woman was the bride. And the dowry was a, a, a set of ten silver pieces and the groom would give it to the bride and it was a symbol of covenant that we are now in covenant relationship with one another and this is a sign that you are a bride and you are spoken for by a groom so this wasn't just any woman this was a bride and this wasn't just any coin this was a coin that was a part of a covenant relationship with the bride in the house but there was a coin that broke away from the bride still present in the house but very much lost can I tell you, you might just be in this house and you might be a part of the coven, covenant and you have now broken away from the bride and you don't even realize because you're in the house, you still think that you're okay. Hear me. Hear me. This coin had been a part of the covenant. But the coin somehow got dislodged, broken away from the bride, and fallen from the body. And now, with no consciousness, no awareness, because it is, it is an inanimate object, Jesus is giving us the picture that you can be in the house. You can have been a part of the covenant, but you've broken away from the bride, and you don't even realize how far you have fallen. But I'm thankful that Jesus said that that lady began to search, and she ended up finding that which was lost. But I'm wanting, to understand, wanting you to understand, but just because you've never left the farm, and you've been faithful this whole time, you can be in the house, but not be found. And this got kind of heavy fast. I didn't want that to get so heavy so fast. 
but just because you're in the house, it's like that old saying. Just because, you know, if you're standing in a garage, does that make you a car? No. But Jesus is trying to say, yes, there are varying differences, levels of being lost. That there are some that are lost in the field, but they know that they are lost. But then there are others that are in the house that have no awareness of how far they have fallen from the body and broken away from the bride. But what God wants to do is He wants to locate that lostness so that it can be found, so that we can move all of heaven and earth. But would you like to know what she did to find what was lost? The Bible said why she was in the house. Not realizing that she was lost. Not realizing that uh, uh, the coin, not realizing it was lost. The bride began to move so that the lost could become found. But the first thing she did was she lit a candle. Right? Now, I'm going to need some help. Can we turn these lights down at all? Do that. Get it down. Just a little bit. Now don't scare me off too much. She lit a candle. Because that coin is in here somewhere. Somebody that is not fully aware of where they stand with God. That you're a part of the covenant, but you've detached away from the bride. It says that that lady, she said, I've got a coin that's lost, so what am I going to do? She said, I'm going to light a candle. You've got a candle here. But did you know that the Bible says that you have a built-in candle? The Bible says, Proverbs 20 and 27, it says that the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. That when you were created, God put in you a spirit. And that spirit, it was going to search the very depths of who you are so that you can be aware and have a consciousness of where you stand with God. And knowing that you may be in the house but not realizing your loss, she said, wait a minute, I'm not going to accommodate that lostness. I'm going to light a candle. You want to know what lights your candle? You were born with a spirit. But did you know you can have the spirit of a man but your candle not be lit? You want to know what lights your candle and makes you aware of the in light? Oh, God, help me. I'll tell you what it is. It's the preached Word of God that lights your candle and makes you aware of where you are and what you've lost yes, and what needs to be found. Are you ready? Uh, that's why Romans 7, 7 says this. Romans 7, 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. He said, It wasn't until that preached word, the law, came to me. It was like Jesus Or in creation, God in creation, He came to Adam after Adam had fallen. He had broken away from covenant relationship. And God comes to Adam and says, where are you, Adam? Why would an all-knowing God ask a question? It's not like He was trying to obtain some information from Adam that He didn't already possess. But when he came to Adam, he knew Adam had not yet left the garden, but he was just as lost as somebody who had. So he says to Adam, where are you, Adam? Where are you? It's not that God didn't know where he was. He was wanting to awaken that awareness and that consciousness in Adam. And when it came to Paul, he said, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. He said, If it were not for the word, my candle would have not been lit. And I would not have known where I stood with God and where I had fallen 
and what had been lost. So we need the preached word of God, somebody to come into your house, to light your candle and say, hey, you're not where you need to be. You got to get back what you've lost. You got to get back to where you once were. You ready to turn the lights down? Pull, pull up that, that verse, Romans 7, 7, in the Amplified Classical. Watch what this says. It says, what then do we conclude? Is the law identical with sin? Certainly not. Nevertheless, if it had not been for the law, I should not have recognized sin or may have made or have known its meaning for instance i would not have known about covetousness would have had no consciousness of sin or sense of guilt if the law had not repeatedly said you shall not covet and have an evil desire for one thing or another he said thank god for the law that same law that condemned me is the same law that lit my candle and it showed me where i was in in proximity to my daddy, to my father. So he said when that preacher came preaching. Turn the lights down. See, listen, I'm going to preach just like this all night long because the light was out in the house, but she knew she lost something. But there was a candle in that house. But thank God there was something to light the candle that needed to be lit so she could find what had now been lost. Thank God for the preacher. It may seem sometimes like it's getting on your nerves, but thank God he's here to light our candle. You ought to say preach to me because I've got to be aware. I've got to be conscious of where I am with God. Ah. And without that candle being lit, you want to know what candles being lit, lit, lit looks like? It looks like Jesus sitting around with his most faithful disciples at a dinner table. And he looks out at them and he says, one of you. Every one of them had been faithful up until this point. Every one of them had sacrificed. Every one of them had. But Jesus looks at them around that table and says, one of you. And you know what the disciples' response was? One gospel writer said this, that they said, every one of them, is it I? Because every one of them with that candle built in, when Jesus asked or said that one of you will betray me, the word began to preach at that table that one of you will betray me. And that candle all of a sudden became lit. And they began to look on the inside of them, understanding their propensity to that they were able, they, every one of them had the potential to betray him. They began to look on the inside and they began to introspectively look uh, at themselves and where they were knowing that that I have the potential that I can betray him. They didn't say, oh, I know it's him. No, I know he, who he's talking about. No, every one of them allowed the word to preach into their world and to light their candle so they'd begin to look on the inward parts of themselves. Stop looking for a moment. Just stop looking for a moment out of that one lost sheep that they know that they're lost. But what about that last coin in here? Uh, what about that? That's who I'm here for tonight. I know that there's somebody. You're not where you need to be. But God loves you enough to let me light your, to let me light your candle. Somebody, you got to get back what you lost. Come on, clap your hands uh, and let your voice out. Oh, thank God for a pastor. Thank God for a preacher. You want to know why? Because there's some times where I thought I was doing pretty good. Hear me. Hear me. 
There's times where we went home because we do this for a living full time. We have no other employment. We just travel strictly preaching the gospel. And we have seen God do do crazy things, miracles. We've seen people healed of cancer. We've seen people with blind eyes open. We've seen people with crippled limbs become strong. We've seen all, and I go home. Listen, and I'll go home. And when I go home, I strictly ask my pastor, when I come home, I don't want to preach. When I come home, I want to get back connected with the bride and the body. So I sit in that congregation, me, a preacher, me, oh, seeing all the miracles that we've seen, the people that got the whole, I'll go sit in that congregation, preach to me, preach to me, preacher, preach to me, pastor. And I think I'm doing pretty good. And then my pastor gets preaching. And I realized just how lost I actually was. You ever thought you were doing just pretty good? I mean, things were going pretty good. But then somebody just preached a message that just, just ripped your heart out and kind of threw it down on the ground, stomped on it, picked it up, dusted it off, and put it back in your chest. Thank God for a preacher. Thank God for a pastor. Because sometimes we just can't be honest with ourselves. And we need somebody to light that candle because we can't light it ourselves. Think about it. Paul had the same problem. Paul had the same problem, Pastor. He said in verse 9, watch what, what Paul says, Romans 7 verse 9. Watch this. Paul said, for I was alive once without the law. Paul was saying, I was doing pretty good until the law came. Life was just kind of doing all right. But then the law came. For I was alive without the law once, but when the, the commandment came, sin revived. And I died. Paul, that great apostle, he said, I was doing all right. We were seeing miracles. We were seeing God. God was using me. I was faithful. I never left the farm. I hadn't broke no commandments. I did everything that pastor asked of me. But then all of a sudden, the law came. And I realized when that candle was lit, what had been lost. But hear me, he said, and when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Church, I'm about to make a statement. Pastor, I'm about to make a statement. Hear me in the context that I'm saying it. You know what kind of revival we need? We need a sin revival. Not in the sense that we need more sin. Because we've got enough of it in our world. But when he said sin revived, he was saying when that candle was lit, I became aware of what was off. I became aware that I may be present in the house, but my attitude was off. I may be present in the house, but I had something wrong in my spirit. He said when the law came, uh, that sin revived, uh, and I had to die. And Paul goes on to say that I died daily. That means the candle was lit on a consistent basis because he knew that his ability to walk wander would get the best of him at times and I've got to tell you being a young man that preaches the gospel even me it's easy just to wander a little bit and get off just enough that I need that candle lit because I can be lost and not even know it ah. Ah. 
See what we need? We need the word to be preached so we can have a sin revival. Not more sin, but we become aware of the sin that we didn't know was present in our life. I'm not talking about quitting that, stop going. I'm not talking, I'm talking about the deep stuff. The deep stuff where God starts dealing with your character, where he starts dealing with your integrity, where he starts dealing with your attitudes that spawn as a symptom out of a deeper source. once that candle was lit and the light came on somebody right now at the beginning of this year the light needs to come on and you become aware of where you truly stand with God because you sit here in the house like a lost coin present but you're no you're not even a part of the bride right now you've detached yourself but the light came on Watch, Pastor. Once the candle's lit, once the candle's lit, the Bible said she began to sweep the house. In other words, once the light comes on, that enables her to see what she could not see before. When she begins to sweep, that's the bride taking action and obeying the revelation that the light has now given. You know what she did? She said, I just can't have this light and do nothing about it. She said, I've got to act upon what light we now have so I can find what I now know is lost. And so she began to sweep the house, beginning to remove anything that could accommodate lostness. And what I'm telling you for the beginning of this year, you need to allow God to begin to sweep your house because you've got stuff in there that you've allowed to accommodate your lostness. So what you've got to do is begin to sweep the house, begin to rearrange your life, begin to turn tables over, looking for what what you now know is lost. You've got to start looking through the stuff that you've allowed in your house so you can find that piece of you that you know belongs to God but cannot be found. Hear me. I don't want to get caught up in preaching at the expense of saying nothing. Let me talk. We've lost some commitment. We've lost some, some devotions. We've lost prayer lives. We've lost. But Jesus said, I want to send such a sweeping move of the Holy Ghost that you begin to rearrange the house to, so that anything that accommodates lostness can be removed. See, see, what was she sweeping? Stuff that had just bit by bit come into the house. Do you think that lostness just happened overnight? No. No, it was bit by bit. Every time she went out of the house and then she came back in, she brought a little bit of the world in with her. She brought a little bit of dust and a little bit of dirt, a little bit of debris. And little by little, the mess began to accumulate because there wasn't that sweeping taking place in the first place. There wasn't a constant sweeping. But when she began to sweep, this was her taking action because you can't have that kind of light. You can't have the candle lit in your world and do nothing about it. So what she said was, like my wife, when she loses stuff she knows you can't find nothing in a dirty house so she starts doing it she goes up in the children's room and starts picking up Legos I'm like what are you doing I'm trying to find my keys well they ain't up there well I figured if I start up the house I've cleaned the whole house I'll find it eventually but hear me what the bride did was saying that coin's here somewhere. 
And I'm not going to allow things that have come into my life to accommodate that lostness. And I'm going to rearrange whatever needs to be rearranged. I'm going to reprioritize whatever needs to be prioritized. And I'm going to, I'm going to rearrange the furniture. I'm going, to, I'm going to move things out of the way. I told you, my wife, the bride, I've seen her, I've seen her cleaning stuff, vacuuming stuff. And all of a sudden, she becomes he woman. And she'll take that couch and she'll lift it with one hand. You didn't hear it. No, 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 no. But if you allowed to get in the way, that's accommodating accommodating the lostness in your life. So God is calling you to have such a sweeping move of God that it will cause you to action, to do something about what you now know is lost in your life, to change something, to do something different, to rearrange the furniture, look under the table. She she started going through stuff and said, all this dirt and debris, I know this coin is here somewhere. I know it's here somewhere, but I've got to get everything out of the way, everything bit by bit that I've allowed into my house, everything that I've allowed into my life little by little that's accommodated attitudes that's accommodated spirits and and things that I did not know was there but hear me it says after she swept the house got everything out of the way that would be in the way you know what she did the Bible said she began to seek diligently she knew it was here somewhere because she said I lost it in the house so let me say this why are you going to go try to find it somewhere else when you lost it here Because the key to finding what you lost is you got to go back to where you lost it. So don't go out there and try to find what you find what you lost in here. Don't leave trying to find something that's not out there because you lost it here. The Bible said once she had swept the house, the Bible said she began to seek diligently. You know what that looks like? Sister Jenkins, you want to get on that piano? We're about to move into something pretty fast right now. I feel the Holy Ghost. You know what she did? She swept the house. And she admittedly, I've allowed stuff into my life. I've allowed things that have gotten my way and have obstructed my view and my vision. And now I've lost some things that I need to get back. She began to sweep that house. But then when she was done sweeping, she said, all right. I can sweep from my feet, but I can't search, search diligently. On my feet. But I got to do it. From my knees. You want to know how you're going to seek diligently? That final step. Is she got down on her knees. And got her face in the carpet. And she said, God, I know that that coin is in here somewhere. I lost it in here, so I'm not going to go looking somewhere else. I I lost it in this house. I'm going to get it back in this house. So she put her broom aside. And while that candle flickered, she began to look diligently. God, I know it's here. God, I've got to find it. I know. I know I lost it. I know I've lost some things. I've lost some devotion. I've lost some commitment. I've lost some zeal. I've lost some fire. I know it's here. But God, God, help me to locate what I've lost. Help me, God, to be aware of where I am with you. I've allowed junk to get in the way. I've allowed things to obscure my view of where you are. I've never left the farm, but I need to be found. Somebody right now, I want you, if you want to get back, you feel like there's something you lost. I want you to meet me at this altar right now. I want you to come and get down on your knees because the only way you can find what is lost in this house, uh, you got to get on your knees, on your face and say, God, light that candle. Light that candle. I don't want to be lost. I've been faithful, but Lord God, I've drifted. I've been faithful, but I've lost some things along the way. Help me, Lord Jesus. Come on, let that candle burn bright. 
Come on, let that candle burn bright, God. Where am I with you? Are you right with God tonight? That's why you got to get lost so you can be found. Come on, I feel God's asking the P O L C. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you in relationship to God? Come on, God's reaching for you right now. 